and then the other issue that to this day I can I can still remember was a cover that showed um, a, a single ended tube amplifier. Yeah. And then the Krell, and and the tagline was something like, uh, either one of these is wrong, the other one must be right. Or, or sorry, if one of these is right, the other one must be wrong. Or something yes, along those lines. That's my favorite all time issue. Yeah, that was um. God, what was that? Uh, January ninety five, I think it was. And then I repeated that cover line on an issue, one of my last issues before retiring. And I mean, basically, that's what it's about: is you've got two amplifiers, they measure unbelievably differently. The um, the, the tube amp, which I was a carry eight oh five, had very large amounts of second harmonic distortion, which is what you get with a single ended ampli tube amp. The Krell superb measure low noise low distortion um and both have got great reviews so what is the correlation between the measurements and the sound quality and i thought well you know that issue which had those two amplifiers reviewed in it both have got good reviews froze into sharp relief what are we measuring what do the measurements mean um I mean, I could talk about that if you want. I have some well, ideas. Well, that's that. yeah. That that was my next step to to pull you into wait, wait, wait. you know but, what uh, the correlation is. If I remember correctly, there was no definitive answer of any sort. Uh, to this day, it still confuses me. <laughs> right. Here's what I think is happening, which is that if you look at the single-ended tube amp, it's got a bent transfer function, which means. Oh, excuse me. <coughs> It's got a bent transfer function, which means it's producing a lot of even order harmonic distortion. Now, if it's even order, that means it's producing tones which are an octave above those in the music, two octaves above. It's actually consonant. Um, so even though the distortion is high, the sound is going to be fattened up a bit, but in a manner which makes the music warmer, more approachable. If you take a solid state amplifier, with a, which has quite a lot of feedback around it, then what you're going to get, you're not going to get any second harmonic or fourth harmonic because it's basically a push-pull operation that cancels out even order harmonics. You're going to be left with the third. Well, that's not so bad. That's an octave and a fifth above the fundamental notes. But then fifth, seventh, ninth, eleventh are all very objectionable distortions. And I think what you're hearing is that for a solid state amplifier with a lot of feedback, A, it's got to be designed so that it's what's called the open loop behavior before you apply feedback is it's very linear. It's not producing much distortion. And I mean, and then it has to have a wide open limp bandwidth. So as you apply feedback, it's you don't get distortion rising at high frequencies. And that, that is ubiquitous with solid state amps. Higher frequency, the higher the distortion, even with feedback. Um, it reminds me of something the late Peter J. Walker said, founder of Quad, a man I knew quite well. He said, it's very difficult to make a bad tube amplifier because tube to make, if they work at all, basically they're gonna be relatively linear. They're gonna have that, as I said, that nice even order harmonic distortion. So, but if I, but if, if it's it's hard to make one which doesn't work with solid state amplifiers, it's easy to make ones which on paper look good, have vanishingly low distortion apparently, and sound bad. And I think what you have, just to go back to the solid state amplifier, if you if you design it, and if you look at Nelson Pass's designs. Um, the distortion doesn't change with frequency and the distortion doesn't change with level. In other words, the amplifier is in a kind of state of stasis. So that it doesn't change its behavior according to what the music you're putting into it. So you don't get that fattening up that you get with single-ended tube amplifiers, but you do get an amplifier which doesn't change its character, whatever the music. And I think that's the, that's, when people say, you know, you get a good sounding solid state amplifier, that's what they're talking about. Distortion is low. Distortion is low order. Distortion is not changing with frequency or level. That's what's important. But how, how audible is distortion as a function of, of your enjoyment of music? So in other words, given that tubes generally have higher distortion and yet still 
uh, quote unquote enjoyable and musical, and yet solid states that seems to be uh, totally uncorrelated. Yeah, it's it's it, you can't put a number on it because it depends on the harmonic signature, what distortion harmonics are there. I mean, if you have pure second harmonic, I, I actually in one of the stereophile test CDs, I put some listening tests where I took a tone and then added, you know. 1% distortion, 0.3%, 1% sec, 3% second harmonic, 1% second harmonic, 0.3% second harmonic, 0.1% second harmonic. So you could hear for yourself where the sound got corrupted. Very difficult with pure second harmonic. On the same CD I did seventh harmonic, you can hear 0.03% of seven harmonic on a pure tone. It's it you you just can't get get rid of it. So you know, you can't, but you can't, but you can't put a number on the overall THD number. I mean, because it depends on the what harmonics are there, the mix of harmonics, and how they change with frequency and level. And and how important is an amplifier that has high current versus just decent current? Because a good solid state typically has very good high current, and tube amplifiers are not generally known for their high current. No, I mean, I I think. I've done some experiments with looking at how much power you actually need. And I mean, with these um, Vinberg speakers that I reviewed in the April issue, I'm not drawing more than 10 watts. So, you know, 10 watts into eight ohms or 10 watts into four ohms, it's, it's not a lot of current. Um, I think where you get speakers like some of the Wilsons, which had dropped to two ohms or below in the treble, you really do need an amplifier which can deliver a lot of current because of the speaker's low impedance. But um, why do you need a 300 watt amplifier? Not really, is my experience. Other than you get very, you know, you get that headroom for the unexpected peaks. But in general, you don't need a lot of current, I don't think, unless the speaker is. Typically, it has a very low impedance, like the Apogee Scintilla, as I mentioned earlier. You know, one ohm and below at some frequencies. That that speaker just, you know, destroyed amplifiers if if you would let it. Okay. Um, in my mind, what what I really enjoyed reading when when you were writing, uh, and especially your measurements were off speakers. Um, um, and maybe it's because you are one of the few that actually does as many uh, reviews and measurements as you do. Um, so in the case in the case of speakers, what are the what are the measurements that are able that you can correlate with what you hear? Because I. I've I've often wondered if you had two completely different speakers that seem to measure very similarly within a very tight tolerance, and yet probably sound quite different. How how and what can you um, attribute that to, if if anything, to their measurements? I've measured over nine hundred loudspeakers since nineteen eighty nine. I can't think of two which measure the same. Um, what I can tell you is if you look at the measurements in Stereophile, the family of measurements I publish, they will tell you how the speaker sounds. They'll tell you its character, its coloration. They won't tell you if it's good or bad, or they, they won't tell you if you will like it or not. And I mean, if you look at the speakers that measure best, like some of the Revels, um, the Dutch and Dutch speaker that we, we Cal Rubinson reviewed last year, and I did a follow up in the April issue. These speakers, they have flat response. They have superbly well controlled radiation patterns. Um, but you know, there are other speakers. Like last September, I drove up to Sasha Matson's place in upstate New York to listen to measure the. Wilson Sasha DAWs and to listen to them. And I have to say, they don't measure as flat as the Revels, but I really enjoyed listening to them. So, you know, you, it's, it's, it's a bit like, let, let me draw an analogy. You put on your glasses and let's say they have a slight tint in them. First of all, you see the tint, everything looks a bit yellow or a bit blue or a bit amber. And very quickly your eyes adjust to that tint 
and it's gone. It's like it was never there. And I think with very good loudspeakers, which measure slightly differently, what they're doing is imposing a slight tint on the sound, but they're not interfering with the music. And once you get adjusted to that tint, then that you they let the music come unhindered. They have if they have low distortion, if they have wide dynamic range, if they're not don't have an impedance which upsets the amplifier, and they don't have don't have nasty coloration. It's a kind of thing like you know. I remember listening to a horn speaker last year, and it made violas sound like violins, cellos sound like violas. A Fender Stratocaster sounded more like a Fender Telecaster. And I could not adjust to that at all because it was the conflict between what the instruments should sound like and what they actually sounded like on these speakers was too great for me to adjust to. With really good speakers that nevertheless are not quite flat, don't have perfect radiation pattern, power response, if it's not too big, you will adjust to it and then everything sounds correct. You, uh, which brings me to the topic about power response. So there are <clears throat> some different camps where people believe that very broad, uh, strong power response is, is ideal and should be uh, what everybody should try to achieve. And then there are other people who believe in very specific, very directed uh, radiation patterns. What are your thoughts about that, uh, of both camps and why? Well, I think I mean, one thing I found with the Dutch and Dutch speakers, which have this perfectly controlled radiation pattern, very narrow and even across frequency, A, they interfere with the room less, so you get less room colorations just because of the way the speaker is interacting with the room. You get terrific stereo imaging because <clears throat> you're not getting high-level reflections from the sidewalls. Um, I tend to, personally, I tend to like those things. Um, with very, speakers which have a very wide radiation pattern, you know, you're going to have potential problems with the room. That doesn't mean they won't sound good, but it means they're going to take a, going to have to take a lot of care in setting up. Um, the um, back in the day, I remember when you know, particularly German designs emphasized power response over everything. So they German designs in the 70s were going for a flat power response, which meant in a normal room, the on axis response would be rising in the highs. And because you don't just hear the power response, you hear a mixture of the power response and the direct response, the anechoic response. Those speakers to me always sounded unbelievably shrill and bright, even though the power response was flat. Now what designers do, and most designers, I would say, with some exceptions, most designers are looking to carefully control the off-axis response, so the power response gently slopes down. The on-axis response is flat, or maybe have a slight gully in the mid-treble, but the power response slopes down, and that gives you, in a typical room, a really neutral sound. Um, in a big room, it fails because now there's not enough power in the room you know, and it's, the speaker tends to sound dull because in a big room, the power response is starting to dominate. In a small room, in a very small room, say, you know, 12 by 9, you know, the direct sound is going to dominate. In my room, which is like 25 by 17, um, I get a pretty equal mix of the power response and the direct sound at my listening position. And the speakers which work best in my room tend to have that gently controlled power response and a relatively flat, even on axis response. Hmm. I hope that, I hope that reply. I hope, yeah. I hope I've enough. It's, it's a con very complicated subject. The what is the best speaker you've ever measured, and did it correlate with uh, the best sound you've ever heard? Um, the best sound I ever heard was a speaker I never measured. And that was, I visited David Wilson at his, the late David Wilson at his place in Utah. God, I want to say, must have been 2001. I did a road trip after 9-11 to try, try and get my mind off things. And I visited David and he played me the, his whams in his room. And that was perhaps the best reproduced sound I'd ever heard. Um, huge room. Huge speakers, but 
that was quite that was that really impressed me. Probably the best measuring speakers I've ever done are Revel Salontos. Um, I used those for a while. Missed them when they went back. I mean, that's the reviewer's dilemma. You know, you can't afford to buy everything, so most of the stuff you like gets returned to the manufacturer soon after the review. Do you still do you still have your Celestian SL600s with the with the woofers? Uh, yes, uh, I never had the subwoofers with them. Um, I still have the 600s; they're in storage. Um, I still have a pair of B and W Saver signatures that I bought after the review. They're now in storage. Um, I have KFLS 50s that I bought after the review. Those are my sort of reference mini monitors. I still have my LS 35As. Um, the first high performance two way mini I, I ever heard after the LS 35As was a Celestian SL6, which I bought in 82 after <coughs> reviewing. I bought but a pair because I bought a pair because enough. of your review. I bought a pair because of your review. Of the SL6? Yes, with a oh, copper I, I still have them. They're in our bedroom system. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. Um, but as I said, the, the, that, hearing the original Wilson Wham in David Wilson's own room, that was quite an experience. Hmm. Um, when you start when you started to do your own recordings was it through stereophile or no. on your own no no i mean I, as i said my mother bought me a grundig mono grundig tape recorder in 1965 and i used to record myself playing the guitar playing the bass experimenting with electronic music um replace that with a sony stereo in 69 two channel recorder made a lot of recordings with that particularly of local bands um And then the first commercial recording I did was in 1970, a uh, band I was in. Um, we made a record for a new company called York Records. That album came out in the end of 70. I still have my first royalty check from that. It was, it was I think, 75 pence, three quarters <laughs> of a pound. And funny enough, I looked it up on um, <clears throat> eBay recently and copies are going for like $500. Really? And uh, as I said, I... I I kept on recording, um, you know, when I was a professional musician, got familiar with the studios, got, got a Revox A77 in like 78 and made quite a lot of recordings with that. Love that machine. Um, still have it, although the circuit boards have crumbled into dust by now. Um, and basically I, I kept recording. I was, I, you know, I, I, I may have, I think I trying to remember, I think I've done, including the Stereophile recordings, about 40 commercially re released albums altogether since my first in 1970. And I think it very important for reviewers to be actively involved, not just in making music, which a lot are, but also recording to know how, how the microphone techniques change what you're trying to do. Um, <clears throat> um, I mean, re successful recording is not photography. You're not putting up a pair of microphones like you would a camera and just snapping. What you're trying to do is recreate that experience of hearing the group or the band or the choir or the mus musician in a real space. And I've the more natural, I, I try to make natural sounding recordings and there is a lot of artifice goes into that natural sound. I mean, there's, a, there's an album just come out on Naxos of music of the Latvian composer, Eric Sessenvalds. I can send you the link. There's a couple of YouTube versions of it where I used six main microphones in this beautiful hall in um, Mount Angel, Oregon. I used spot microphones on a cello, a viola, various percussion instruments. And the result, I, I with producer Eric Light and I produced something which to me sounds like you were there. Oh. As I said, a lot of artifice has gone into producing <laughs> that effect, that that feeling of realism. Yeah, definitely send us a link, and and Jay will put it in the description box, and so that people can check it out for themselves. Is this is this now available commercially? Yes, it came out on Naxos in March, and um, yeah, I'll, I'll send you the link. It's, oh, um, I look forward to it. Yeah, so What? I mean, sorry. I was going to say, out of all the recordings you've done, which is the one that you think has been 
um, the most successful, not in terms of um, sales, but in terms of trying to reach that ideal that you had in your mind? This latest one, I, okay. you know, it's it's. I think it's the fourth time, fourth year that I recorded this this choir, the Portland State Chamber Choir, uh, first time in this new hall. But um, we made we, we, the the sessions I was involved in were last June, June two thousand and nineteen, and I went into them with the experience of that choir and the experience of having done three years previous recordings with them, um, I knew what I wanted. I, I knew from the outset, as I stepped into the hall, how I was going to capture them. And um, so, I mean, I think that was the best one yet. Okay. Well, we definitely want to check this out. Um, and then part three of this uh, uh, conversation, uh, I titled Advice for Audiophiles. Given a certain proportion, uh, budget, I should say, somebody comes to you and say, John, what would you do? Uh, what's a proportion of budget you would recommend for uh, speakers, electronics, etc.? What would you give? What would you say? I would say speakers, 30%. They make the sound, but they can't put right what's gone wrong upstream. As I said earlier, my first upgrade was not to change the speakers or the amplifier, but was to change the turntable, replacing the garage with the thorns. And then I've used Lynn turntables since 1977. Um, I think the source is, is paramount, not so much in these digital days, but, um, you know, uh, but I would say I would say source, most important, amplifiers, next important, speakers, least important. That doesn't mean speakers don't matter, but if you have a little set budget, get the best pair, best sounding pair of inexpensive speakers that you like the sound of, and then spend your remaining budget equally between amplification and source. And then upgrading, probably upgrading the amplifier next, Upgrade the speakers last as long as they're, you know, because how can I put this best? Don't get speakers that are too big for your room. Um, you know, if you have a big speaker in a small room, which, as I said, I used to visit Harry Pearson's place back in the day, and he had the Infinity IRSs in a small room. They sounded magnificent, but way too much bass. Um, and so if you get speakers, big speakers in a small room, you will have too much bass. Everything will sound bass heavy. So get speakers which only have an, enough extension for your room. Um, I did a, there's a feature online on the Stereophile website on how to set speakers up in a room. I can send you the link. That was um, my next question. How do you set up uh, speakers in the room? Yes. Well, I'll send you the link because. Okay. No, <laughs> that's good. good. I give you one piece of advice that I, I learned from Gordon Holt was, and I mentioned this in the article online, get a friend in, you sit in your listening chair and have him move around the room talking. And where, where his voice sounds the most natural, that's your starting point for where you put the speakers. Excellent. Yeah, and Jay will put that in the link and uh, the description that's, box. As well. uh, that's very funny because uh, I often advise people on subwoofer placements, sort of on, on a similar theory. Yeah, you put the subwoofer oh, where yes. you sit, and you walk around the room until you hear where the bass is best. Yeah. Okay, and part four, the last part is parting thoughts. Um, uh, I, I was going to ask you most memorable lifelike system, but you already said there was the Wilsons, the WAMs. Yeah. Um, five of the best, most innovative and talented designers you've met. It was difficult to get them down to five. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but uh, I tell you, on amplifiers, Nelson Pass, John Curl, Bruno Putzes, all these engineers on amplifiers start from first principles. They don't take an existing design. They actually look at the circuit in its most fundamental, from its most fundamental properties and design upwards from there. That was something my physics professor at university told me. Don't take anything for granted. Start from fundamental principles. I would say on loudspeakers, um, the late secret Linkfits, again, did so much looking at what loudspeakers should do from first principles. Um, 
Lawrence Dickey at Vivid once was at BMW, did the um, Nautil, BMW Nautiluses. Um, now he's at Vivid. He again starts from first principles. What's a loudspeaker supposed to do? How does it do it? Rather than just building on an existing design. Um, and then, of course, the late Peter Walker, as I said, I knew him very well. I actually recorded an orchestra he was playing in in 1984, one of my first digital recordings. Um, Peter, I, I, rem I remember sitting next to him. We, I was, went to an AES convention in, in Vienna, must have been 92, and I got on the air flight plane for the flight back to London, and um, Peter kind of sat next to me just by coincidence. And that hour and a half flight was like I was taking my oral finals at university again because he questioned everything and wanted to know why did why did I think that? Why did I say that? And he used to, I remember he said, everything in audio can be reduced to Ohm's law and common sense. And that has stuck, he said, I started stuck with me ever since that, yeah, Ohm's law, voltage, current, resistance, and common sense. How do you apply Ohm's law to the speaker or the amplifier or whatever? He he was a brilliant man. I remember him. him said, I remember visiting him in '81, and he'd got the prototype ESL 63, and I got up there with John Crabb to interview Peter and to listen to these prototypes, and he put them on a chair. He said, "Well, they really should be on a stand, but no one's going to buy stands for them, so we're going to sell it as a floor speaker." And he put it on a stand and he put it on a square wave and he put a microphone in front. And he said, you see, this speaker will produce a perfect square wave. But I don't think that matters. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> and I, I thought about that ever since. And I, I think when you get time coherent speakers like Teal's, Van der Steen's, it's nice to have it, but it's not the most important thing. And I think that's what Peter was saying in his inimitable way. It's nice to have it. It's not the most important thing. Other things have to be right first. Okay. Um, yeah, so. You, you mentioned, uh, just as a, 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 a point, Bruno Pazzi's, who, uh, uh, by all accounts, uh, in incredibly knowledgeable and talented, and he yeah. believes that um, feedback is uh, something that very few people know that much about. And uh, I, if I remember reading a, a, an article, he experimented with huge amounts of feedback and, and thought that, in fact, it was uh, a good thing, sonically. Yes. Or am I wrong? I, I mean, I know I've, I've read Bruno's writings on this. And I mean, I also, I remember big arguments between him and the late Charlie Hansen. Charlie Hansen is yes. also an, yes. an engineer near Charlie of air acoustics and it comes back to the fact if a basic amplifier circuit is good you can use huge amounts of feedback Charlie would say well you know if a basic amplifier circuit is good you actually don't need to use a lot of feedback it's like it's like Charlie and Bruno were on both sides of a mountain both looking at the peak and Bruno saying well we'll go this way round to get to the top and Charlie's saying, well, we can also go this way around to get to the top. But the, the peak is the same. The journey is different. Hmm. Um, I asked you for 10 of the best recorded albums of any genre that you would recommend for audiophiles, especially today with Tidal and so on. I think people would love to hear uh, and add to their collection. So if you have, uh, when, when you get a chance, uh, uh, send me a list of what I'll you would recommend. I'll send you a list. Yeah, and, and Jay will add to the bottom as well, to the description. Uh, I'm asking that of all the masters. Um, uh, two versus solid state. Well, we kind of went over that before. It's, yes. I mean, well, what would you end, buy yourself? It doesn't. It's what you want your system to do. And you can make great sounding systems with tubes. You can make great sounding system with solid state. Now, what would what would John Atkinson do? Well, every now and again, I drag out my SP10, which I bought in 1984. And it makes my system sound wonderful. And then I think about the hundreds of dollars it's going to cost to retube it. So I put it away again. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't use a preamplifier anymore. I just use a DAC with a high precision volume control and feed the power amplifiers directly. Um, I don't I know use... if that's... 
I, I don't know if that answers digital versus analog. Well, when CDs came out, I loved them because I, I was always a big fan of piano recordings, solo piano, solo classical piano, and LP never did it for me because of the pitch instability in the bass, in the left-hand register of the piano. It never got that, nailed it down the way you hear in real life. Digital did. Left hand of piano sounded magnificent and like the real thing. And of course, then it takes you time, time to realize what you're missing with those early digital recordings for space, the um, ambience, the warmth. You know, analog to digital converters weren't very good back in the end of the 70s, early 80s. So, you know, if you like solo piano recordings, you had to go with compact disc and try and grip your teeth at whatever things which you're missing from good analog. Nowadays, I think if you're listening to 24-bit, 192K, digital, recorded with care by an engineer who knows what he's doing in terms of capturing sound, it still won't sound like an LP, but I think the LP has things going for it that digital doesn't. For example, the ritual of taking an LP out of a sleeve of putting it on the turntable, of wiping it with your with your brush, of you know starting it up. You have the big sleeve with all the sleeve notes. That's a ritual which is very important to enjoyment of music. It sets your brain up to enjoy what you're about to hear. I mean, and, and ritual is everybody. You know, churches have known this for thousands of years. It's all about ritual. It's all about preparing your brain to be receptive to what you're about to experience. I mean, same thing with a live concert. You go in and there's that magic moment when the audience noise goes down, the conductor lifts his baton. That's a magic moment. And your brain is set up to appreciate what's about to happen. You don't get that with pressing play on the iPad. <laughs> there's no ritual to it. It's just you know, so, you know, analog has that ritual aspect to it, which is very important. Digital doesn't, not anymore. Um, state of our industry. Um, it's, it's, it's ironic that today we have uh, more online magazines, forums, websites, um, catering to audiophiles, people who love music. We have more access to music than ever before, easily accessible. Um, and yet our industry seems to be, at least in North America, in the decline. Um, uh, why do you think that? And uh, do you have any thoughts about how that could change or how to turn that around? Yeah, I wish I knew how to change it. I, I don't. I think that what you're seeing is there's first a, a shift in how people appreciate music. I mean, I have three children. None of them have hi-fi systems. Mostly they listen to music on their phones or their computers. And the thought of, they find the thought of doing what I do and what you do and what our readers do and your customers do, of go, having a place where you go to the music to listen, that's alien to them. I think, and I don't know why that should be. I, I don't know. I mean, as I said, you know, I have three children. Their, their father has you know, been the editor of two hi-fi magazines, but they don't seem to care. They, they all love music. Um, my two daughters play music, and my, my son loves music, but he gets most of his music on his phone or on, on his laptop. I, it's a puzzle. Um, I think what you have, and I've written about this in the magazine, what you've, and maybe as a retailer you would have some insight, is you've seen prices exponentially increase as companies chase a smaller number of very wealthy customers. And the, the middle, the middle of the hi-fi industry, affordable amplifiers, affordable speakers, high quality amplifiers and speakers has seemed to have disappeared. So you've got now a gap between mass market stuff, you know, your Sonos's and so on, and very expensive stuff. But in the middle, where I used to shop when I was a student, where you shopped as a student, where my readers in the 90s of Stereophile shopped, that, that whole area, to me, seems to be disappearing. Is that correct? 
Yeah, it, it's it's definitely um, that 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 consumer either doesn't buy at all, or we're we're fortunate that we're seeing a, a a new wave, if you will, of people buying used, very good gear, and and uh, we're we're really, at least I am, very glad to see that because it means there's still hope. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, um, yeah, my, my partner Larry Archibald said, twenty five years ago, he wrote a piece for Stereophile. He said. The, the audio industry's biggest competitor are the products they sold last year yeah. because the products <clears throat> don't break, don't wear out, and they're still really good. So, mm. you know, buying secondhand is, is a comp, you know, it's competition for, the, for, for you trying to sell new equipment. Yeah. And last question, uh, John, and thank you for being so generous with your time. Oh, um, you're welcome. What are you most proud of accomplishing in the audio uh, world that we inhabit? Well, in a sense, it's 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 odd to it's odd to what I'm about to say because in publishing, same as in music, you're only as good as your last gig. In in with magazines, you're only as good as your last magazine. You know what you, what's gone before doesn't matter so much as what the most recent issue says or your most recent recent gig as a musician. But I I am proud of having been in having edited an audio magazine, high first High Fi News and then Stereophile, for editing editing those magazines for coming up to thirty eight years. I think that's the longest anyone has worked as an audio magazine editor ever and i think you know i look back i i mean in my room here i've got all the stereophiles all the hi-fi newses uh, and a whole bunch of other people's magazines as well and i look at those and i think yeah that was that 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 was a good career i enjoyed it i gave something back well th this this has been a real highlight and a treat for me. I, I obviously can't speak for the guys, but I, I have been looking forward. In fact, I didn't sleep very much this uh, last oh. night because I was thinking about uh, going through the questions that I had in my list and why, making sure that I had the questions right and, and making sure I didn't forget anything I wanted to ask you. And thank you so much. I really am very oh, grateful that you, you took the welcome. time. And 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 um, um, if, if this uh, pandemic ever clears up and there's some sort of a version of um, another trade show and do you go to trade shows anymore? Uh, I, I, the last one I went to was Axpona last year. Um, I had a conflict for Rocky Mountain, otherwise I would have gone. And then this year I was all set to go to Axpona. And of course, there is no they canceled you know, post moment and then the cancellation. I was going to go to Germany, no Munich. Who knows what's going to happen with Rocky Mountain? I'm sort of thinking that, I mean, I'm a high risk person. I'm in my 70s, I've had asthma all my life. Um, it's not good for me to be in a closed space with lots of people. So I'm not sure if I'm going to go to any more shows. Mm. Well, if that ever changes and, and we meet, I, I'll buy the first one. Okay. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, uh, I'm sorry, what's that? Thank you so much. Oh, no. You. Entirely my pleasure. Uh, boys, do you have any uh, last words for John? Any, any questions? Any uh, comments? Thank you. Oh, just... uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so, John, if you uh, send us the link of that CD that you mentioned, or that music that you yes. mentioned, and 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 ten songs or albums that you think any decent, self-respecting audiophile needs to have or listen to, yeah. please send send me that list, and I will uh, make sure that Jay gets it. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you again, John, and uh, take care of yourself and the family, and uh, we'll see Likewise. you again sometime. Take care. Stay, stay everybody. Okay. Bye-bye.